G'day guys and welcome back to the Back Pocket Plug Up Podcast. We're live in studio today. Back in the studio with a belly full of curry. Yes. And tonight's a bit of a different one. It's a Sunday night. It is a Sunday night. So you are unable to do Mondays anymore. Yes, I'm uh, hosting trivia at a new venue for Ship Pub Trivia at the Yorkshire and Stingo on Hoddle Street in Abbotsford. So (laughs) if you're ever bored on a Monday night and you feel like answering some questions, come on down. No, I love that, and I rate that. But yeah, Sunday night football. We've sort of, uh, sort of done a, a Carlton and and played us in our right positions by doing the show in studio and back to the curry. We didn't mix things up too much. Um, get back to what we know, and we're in for a good app. Yeah, I love the analogy of us eating curry in Armstrong Creek compared to <laughs> Zach Williams moving back to the halfback <laughs> flank, which I think is what you were alluding to there. I was, I was. Fantastic analogy. But without further ado, it's time to get into the headline for Dawson Rodge Daily, which yes. uh, which is the new name of our uh, newspaper. And our headline is Deliberate Does D's Dirty. Jeez, if people thought we talked about the D's and the Blues a bit too much, uh, that's not going to change. Well, I want to see you fire up because I can imagine I was fired up as a complete neutral. Obviously, I have a soft spot for the D's. Uh, I'd love nothing but success for you, but I want to get your opinion on it because, yeah, it, it wasn't pretty viewing from where I was sitting. Well, yeah, it was frustrating and I was calm all game. Mm. Uh, I got a lot of trust in the boys that they can get it done when we need to get it done. Um, so I was sitting there watching the game and I thought, Fair play to the Crows. They took it up to us and yeah. like came with a plan, stuck at it. I didn't think it was going to last for four quarters. Absolutely lasted the full 120 minutes. Um, just really high tempo, high pressure. The way they moved the ball was very quick and fast. Um, yeah, they were unbelievable. But we kick a couple with about five minutes to go and I thought, geez, another one where it's like a bit of a slog but we've got away with it. Then they kick a couple in a row and I was a bit nervous. And then, yeah. A couple of controversial decisions. Ben mm-hmm. Keys, I, I felt like it was holding the ball every day of the week and twice yeah. on Sundays, but uh, what, wasn't paid. What I said to you earlier in the week yep. is if Melbourne was wearing blue and white hoops and the game was at Cadinia Park, yep. you can be rest assured that that's holding the ball. 100%. And you can be rest assured that that's deliberate out of bounds. So it's such a weird moment. And I don't blame, I don't actually blame the umpires because they have got the toughest, most uh, unthankful you know, job in football. Mm. Uh, so I don't blame them because, hey, who knows if I was in the position, maybe I'd crumble under the pressure as well. But yeah. it is such a weird psychological thing how they like to say that they don't think there's a home ground advantage when it comes to the umpires, but they're 100% is. No, they're 100% is. From the vibe you get, from, from like the crowd pressure, from the way the ball bounces at home grounds compared to The noise to of affirmation. It's Yes, the noise of affirmation. They were loud, the Crowey supporters. Um, yeah, they were unbelievable. And to get themselves back into the game and then pinch the lead with a minute to go, so, so brave and so much ticker. I, I wish we just had that, that last chance to, you know, I, I wouldn't, wouldn't have minded if Tommy Mack went back, munged it out in the fall. The Crows have pulled off an absolute um, unbelievable victory. Um but I was a little bit disappointed that we didn't get that last chance. But earlier in the year, I was loving, uh, I was loving human error, and yep. and I did like the drama around it. I'm watching this, going, "What's happening?" There's so mm. much drama. So I did like that. And maybe if I wasn't nine and zip, I'd be irate. But I was a little bit disappointing, and it stings a bit. See, so I don't love human error, but I do love. The grey area. I used to hate the grey area of our game, the free mm. kicks. It used to really irk me and I thought, why are we just about the only sport in the world that has this much grey area? Like in a game of soccer, there might be um, a bad decision. The umpire makes a wrong decision. But it's clear cut afterwards. Everyone agrees it was a wrong decision or it was a right decision. Yeah. Whereas in footy, there's a million decisions in a game where there's so many, so much grey area. Half the supporters or AFL supporter thinks the free kick half doesn't. Mm. So I like grey area. I mm. like the discussion <laughs> and the debate that goes with grey area. Was that in the back? Was there enough contact? But I don't love human error. Like, oh, the, yeah. like that was a blatant. You it, know, how many times is it deliberate out of bounds? And you go. How stiff is that? Like they're just they're calling deliberate out of bounds for absolutely anything. It's but the rule we were talking last week that the I think we were maybe maybe it was a private conversation that the rule may as well be now if you the last touch of a kick mm. may as well be a turnover of possession because that's pretty much what the free it should kick be is now. it should be which I like kick or a handball yeah different story if it fumbles over but 
Um, which I wouldn't hate either. They do it in the sample and apparently it's pretty good footy. Mm. But that was just... So to, considering that's what the rule may as well be because that's they just pay it willy-nilly all the yeah. time. They couldn't be quicker to pay yeah. deliberate out-of-bounds ne- nowadays. For that not to be a free kick... Yeah, well, you, when I was watching it, you're going, well, that's going towards the goals and if that sneaks in, it's... He had Spargo pretty hot in his heels. It's probably... It's deliberate if it goes through the behinds as well because he was outside the square. Yeah, I would still be appealing it. But to to go the other side of the point post, go out of bounds, it was like... Has to be. Has to be. And then then when he didn't, I was like absolutely flabbergasted and um, spewing, to be honest. But Mm. what one thing I don't like, and I think like 99% of the Crows fans have been unreal. I did cop a couple of yep. hateful messages in me DMs. As you do, that's just a price of fame. <laughs> Some and real celebrity. up yours, you arrogant Melbourne. <laughs> and I didn't know there was a rude finger emoji. <laughs> but I got a couple. Oh, did you get a rude finger emoji? <laughs> I wasn't sure that was not really a thing either. I got a few of them. But um, no, I, I think 99% of the Adelaide supporters have been good, but I have been going through the threads of like Twitter and Facebook and seeing some Adelaide fans trying to nitpick and dispute that it wasn't deliberate. Right. I reckon it's one of those ones, like, a, like a Tom Dude on uh, Sunday Footy Show, where you you just own it. Like you go, I got away with that. I got away with one. That's pretty funny. Because Tom Dude was like jokingly saying, nah, nah, it wasn't there, mate. But, yeah. But he knew. He knew. But I've seen some, yeah, some Crows fans genuinely saying, oh, nah, Spargo came, came across and... and got hand on it before it went out and he tapped his hand. So he, and it was like, no, he's just, he genuinely handled it to the line. I think, and I, I, I don't know the young bloke's name, Murray, something Murray. Yeah. Something like that. Um, they've got a, a, a plethora of young guns, the crows, but yeah, the young bloke, he was running towards the line. He was just about to get caught. So in his head, he's going, well, this is what I think. Um, from a twos <laughs> under 90s player. But, yeah. um, what, you mean you don't have <laughs> special access to the, the deep death, depths of his psyche? For a minute there, I thought you had the real inside information of what he was thinking at the time. So I'm going to put a, a couple of puzzle pieces together yeah. here, but I, I think he went, look, I'm going to rush this. Yep. And then went, well, there's a lot to think about in point two of a second. But, but hey, your brain ha- does work that ha- quickly. Yeah, ha- hang on. If I rush this, it's a draw. So I've, like, I'm under the I'm gonna. I'm just about to get caught. Normal instinct is defensively, like, rush it, get it to the boundary. I think he's gone, do I rush this? Oh, no, I can't because it's going to be a draw. While he was already in the motion. Tried yeah. to tug it a little bit more boundary side. And he got away with it. And it was fair fair play. And uh, I got a lot of get crommed in the DMs <laughs> as well. But fair, fair play to the Crows. That was a, a, a massive win and um, and a huge scalp. Fair play. Now, we only do this show once a week. So, I do hate to keep on uh, bringing something back into the conversation that we've already I think it's more before. relevant than ever now, though. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but I think, yeah, we have to talk about I'm it. I'm on board now. The captain's challenge or the captain's call. We wouldn't be having this discussion to this degree if we had the captain's challenge. Each, That's, yeah. Each captain has one review. And you once again, people go, oh, there's going to be too many stoppages. But you wouldn't do it for a little chopping of the arms halfway through the second quarter where it was a ticky touch. Mm. Because the rule would be, if you did a captain's call, if there's any grey area, even 1% of grey area, yep. then the decision stays with the on-field umpire's call. Yep. It's only for the blatant, you <laughs> cannot argue free kicks where it'll get overturned. So I don't buy into the theory that if there was a captain's challenge or a captain's call where the captain can review it, I don't buy into the theory that that would change the game because it's so everything up. There'd be too many reviews. You only have one review. You save it for a dead set black mm. or white review. And if you get it wrong and it's great, yeah, you lose it. So there's only ever going to be one per team, or if there's more than one per team reviews, yep. then that it means that they've gotten the decisions right. So it's a, it'd be good for the game. So bringing it back onto the agenda. I like it. Said it a couple of times now, the captain's challenge. There was another one, the Brody Grundy in the back that the game we just watched, Collingwood Port. For mine, if anyone cares about my opinion, um, I think he tripped over his own feet. Yep. Uh, when you're running into a ruck contest directly Posing each other when you fall, bloke in front of you falls over. Of course, you're going to fall on top of him. Yep. So for mine, I think there's enough grey area for us to call it play on. Uh, but uh, yeah, for that decision as well, Collingwood fi- fans are going absolutely nuts, absolutely bonkers. They think mm-hmm. it should have been a free kick. Well, guess what? If you had the captain's call, you could have reviewed it, and who knows? You could have um, 
Could have had the free kick. I think it would add so much to our game. Nah, I like it. I don't think I was on board six weeks ago, but after the weekend, <laughs> oh, I definitely like it. Yeah, it was a big uh, weekend of controversy and a big weekend of success and failures as there is every week of footy. So my question to you, uh, we did it a few weeks ago, is what are your premiership power rankings, do you reckon? Who is sort of leading the charge? Maybe your top four in terms of who your best premiership fancies are. <laughs> Who's on top? Who do you think? Am, am I... so? Is it like right now who's showed the best or is it like how I actually think how the you premiership think end up? Because as we know, uh, yeah, like, no, Richmond, good like Richmond are a ninth and they probably, you know, if, if they weren't Richmond, the team, the great team that's just won the last two flags, if they had beat, if say, for example, their name was Carlton and mm. they showed the form they had this year, they wouldn't be anywhere near your power rankings because you think they haven't played that good of footy. But knowing what Richmond can produce when it comes to September – um, and knowing they have a few players out, etc., they could be high up in your power rankings because yep. you know what they're capable of. So it's slightly different to who's has the best form up until this point. <laughs> well, all right. So my yeah, my top four would be, and it's really really tough because I'm I am sold on the Bulldogs. I think they're a premiership threat. I think they're a premiership fancy, mm. but I'm still not sure they're my number one for some reason. I don't know whether it's the and you could say this about the next couple of sides I'm going to say in the top four, but I don't know if it's the Marvel. MCG September factor or yep. what it is, but I think right now, and I'm going to get rinsed in the comments for this, and it's fair enough, but right now, and then looking into the future, I probably go Brisbane, Geelong, mm. Bulldogs, and then I'm going to say the D's at the moment, but you, there'll be people saying Port. I think Port have lost a little bit of trust at the moment, yep. and then people would be like, well, where's Richmond? And I think... They will be in the top eight, but I think at this point in time, the way they're playing, and I know they've got the runs on the board, so I probably look like a bit of a dickhead saying this, but I just think it might be one of those years where they they can't do it. Yeah. Uh, oh, I'm not writing them off. I'm it's not writing the tags off. going to make for such an awesome dynamic in finals because I say they miss the four and they're fifth and they win the first final against yep. eighth yep. and then they – play a team like a Bulldogs or a Melbourne who've lost the first final. And mm. it's such a magic storyline. Like, I reckon they get... I reckon they... If the Ds lose week one and we verse the Tigers, I I wouldn't say we're going to win. <laughs> isn't that? Isn't it going to be the best final series? For my, it will be. Yep. My uh, power rankings, I still have the Ds on top. Purely be, be... Like, I love the brand of football they're playing. But if... That decision had to go in their way. The holding the ball, all the deliberate, which it should have. Like for me, mine, they were both blatant. Yep. And I know for every team, you could go back to points during the season and say, oh, if that decision had mm. gone that way or if that injury. But the fact is, if that had been deliberate, you probably kick that goal and you're undefeated right now and playing an unbelievable brand of football. Yep. So um, considering you should really be undefeated still, I don't know how you could possibly look past you for premiership favourite because um, he can't be beaten. Well, yeah, the way I went off was like how I think it's going to f- end up taking place uh, towards the yeah, – in the future. I think on power rankings now, and I'll probably fuck the whole segment up by taking it the way I took it, but I think the Ds probably are. But I, I look ahead like we've lost to the Crows. Um, we've got the Bulldogs and then You're Brisbane. You're thinking of it 100% the right way, like it, it, projecting it, into the future. We, we could drop three in a row and I'm sort of factoring – that and I'm still factoring into the future as well and I just see your brand of footy and your list and your depth being too appealing to ignore so I go D's one dogs mm-hmm. two cats three and uh Brisbane four it is it's the best year of footy it is it is and if branches down after the top four and your you know direct power rankings fact is Richmond's ninth so someone has to drop out of the eight and people, and you know, t- sides outside of the eight, like Freo beat Sydney, and that, you know, at different times they're capable of playing, playing some pretty good footy. Yep. Don't get me wrong, I certainly don't think they're going to make the eight, but there's there's a bit of depth there in, in terms of teams. And, you know, my next question to you is who, I assume we all agree that Richmond are going to make the eight. So yep. who do you see coming out? Do you think it'll be Sydney who are seventh or perhaps? Uh, GWS who have just snuck in or do you think even um, maybe who knows it could be a Hayden Larry and maybe a free or a Carlton do get in who knows I think the Giants make it yeah yeah and I pretty much wrote them off at the start of the year I thought they were done 
Well, everyone, even, you know, on, on the couches and 360s, yeah. everyone was saying rebuild. They were in the furnace going, uh, well, let's trade your Josh Kellys and whatnot. Let's get some draft picks back in and start again. But here they are. They're playing the kids. They're winning games of footy. And um, they're right in the mixer. So if you think that they remain in, and I assume you think Richmond come in, does that mean you think Sydney drop out? Oh, my God. Um, I think I said earlier in the season... And I probably chopped and changed, but I think I said that the Swans don't make it. Like they're just they're playing well at the start of the year. They got massive scalps. They, they but, had but, really big. But scalps then at the after start of the we season. played them, I was like, "Well, the Swans are in. The Swans are going to make it." And they they um, beat you along. So I think I might have changed my mind a couple of times on them. At this point in time, I'm a little bit worried about their longevity in the season. Yeah. So right now, as of round ten, whether I had this. Well, I think I'm changing my mind, but I think Sydney probably drop out. Mm. Tough one. They are <laughs> such a quality side, and they've had so many good scalps this season that um, it's hard to see them dropping out. But you just it's hard. It's impossible to see Richmond not making. What the do you, yeah? What do you think? So one of Sydney or the Giants are going to drop out, or it could be West Coast. Um, wow! And West Coast, you know they they've been playing some pretty uninspiring football at different points during the season, and you do. Assume that you know they play in half their games at Optus Stadium. Yeah, uh, you do assume that that'll be enough to make them get into the eight. Yeah, but the brand, if you're going purely on brand of footy, I'm probably liking what I see more. In fact, I'm definitely liking what I see more from the Giants and the Swans 100%, than yeah. what I do West Coast. So, look, it'll probably be one of Giants or Sydney, but don't be surprised if you see West Coast slide. Um, and that paves the way for for Richmond in. But if I had to take a punt, if I had to put me money on something, I'd probably be say be saying the Giants myself. I think the Giants. I think Sydney have got big enough scalps to suggest that they're 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 the real deal. Whereas Giants, um, they're playing some really good footy. They're proving a lot of people wrong, but I don't think they quite have the scalps yet that Sydney have. Yeah, hundred percent. And it's sort of weird because I know teams um do drop down. Mm through seasons and like teams you don't expect like I remember everyone penciling the Crows in to make finals one year and they dropped out and it was a bit, bit surprising or the D's oh you know 2019 they're going to be a shoe in and they didn't make it so I know that that happens but I feel like this time in the AFL there's four teams that I think will make finals next year in like your, your, your Dockers your Blues I'd say the Saints, really, even though I'm a bit iffy on them, and we'll get to them shortly. But, yeah. you know, there's three or four teams outside the eight that you go, oh, well, next year is when they make the eight. Natural development, they get a couple of good players in. I mean, that was meant to be Carlton this year, but you still go again. Yeah. Natural development, and plus a couple of new players through the door. Another year under the coaching system, surely they make the eight. Yeah, so that's how I you view it. But I'm looking at the AFL going, I don't see any, teams any team dropping soon. Like, I don't know if it's sort of... Like, I know the pies are done, uh, we assume, for mm. now. Um, and I mean that respectively for the next couple of years. You, I, you, I don't mean it respectfully. <laughs> they've, they've, they've written their own death warrant with the way they've, <laughs> they've done their list management. You only have yourself to blame. You are finished for the next few years to come. Yeah, good point. Um, so I feel like they're going through a bit of a rejuvenation period. But apart from that, uh, I, I think, well, the Swans... Uh, only at the beginning of their stint. The Bulldogs are sort of in the middle slash, you know, uh, beginning of their stint. The Ds are quite a young side. The Tigers are the still Tigers. still well, still well, young. The Cats, I think they're going to fall out of the eight every year and they just keep they just going keep up on and up. On. The Lions are a young side. So there's Port are at the start of their three or four year stint. So it's... Gonna, it's just going to get harder and harder every season. And I look at uh, Carlton, obviously the team that uh, I'm most adept to speaking about. Mm. And I know no other club has done it the way we did it or as aggressively and openly as we did it. But the pain we had to go through to get the draft picks through the door, we literally said, you know what, bugger it. We're gonna, we know with our list management what we're planning to doing. We're going to have three years of the worst football you've ever seen, yep. but it'll be worth it in six years' time for our supporters when mm. when we come when these kids come good. So to be here now where we've gone through that unbelievable pain where you're just seeing no joy all season, your joy comes from looking at the kids and going, oh, yeah, in five mm. years' time, yeah, we'll be making the eight. 
when that five years fast forward and you like you've all the reasons you've just said it's so hard to see the players slipping out, these players are starting to reach prime ish age. Mm. And we're getting big names through the door. Your Williams, your side, they reckon that we're gonna be going hard for some others, a Chera or a Zach Merritt. If we get these players in and there's no reward for those years of pain, I know. It is terrifying. Nearly. It, it makes me the hairs on me back of my <laughs> neck stand up thinking about what that what that'd make me feel like. Well, I I feel a bit crook knowing that more than half the comp doesn't make finals. Yep. Like back in the day, it was like every second team makes finals. So at least every couple of years, your team's pinching at an eighth or, or whatever. Like, um, but now we're getting like the D's were out of finals for t- uh, 12 years. The Saints were out of finals for 10 years. Uh, the Blues are getting to that sort of 10 mm. year ish, eight, eight, seven, seven, eight year stints out of the finals. So we're getting more teams missing than making, and that makes the road harder and longer. And obviously, it means less teams are going to win the premiership. And how shit is it when you go through the pain that we've gone through? You know, you go through the list management fallout and then the pick you back up, the rebuild, and then you get there. And then if, you, if you're one of those teams, like, you know, a St. Kilda, when they had that bloody awesome list of Rewald, mm. Hayes, Goddard, to reach the pinnacle and not get the success, then you fall back down would be the most guttering feeling. Like, it's it's equally as bad when you're a team like Carlton who had the Murphy, the Gibbs, the Cruiser. You get Judd in, Fev up front, and you and then we reached a pinnacle of like a uh, qualifying, uh, not a qualifying, a um, semi-final. Yep. And then that was our peak and then we bottom out again. It's so painful. You just need to get need to get it right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when you think about it, um, I can't remember if we talked about this last week once again or whether this was just us talking footy, but <laughs> um, really by by odds, the way the league is built in terms of equal, uh, equality and the the mm. draft and whatnot, you should be winning a flag one in every 18 years. So if you're not winning one in every 18, you're failing as yep. a club. Yep. And that means that you're entitled to, assuming you live till about 85, you know, which is a great innings, you're, you're meant to see four flags yep. in your lifetime. And Hawthorne did four at the blink of an eye. Richmond have done three and they'll probably win another one soon. Mm. So, yeah, I I, I am wor- seriously worried as a as a blue bagger that uh, – we may not be seeing that for well, yeah. I, I I shudder and fear and and think it's a little bit unfair how how minimal the amount of success I will see in my lifetime. I think it's a bit tragic. But um, I, I shared you the link of the MCC did a post on their Twitter and it was the oldest MCC member and he's 104 years old and there was a picture of him in the stands and they said, oh, you know, Johnny Johnson's um, 104 years old. Um, he's seen. Both the Bulldogs flags. And I'm like, he's 104 seasons on this earth. That hurts so much. Being an MCC member, 104, and he's seen two flags? It's an interesting thing. Two? It's such an interesting (laughs) dynamic football, how football is so, and sport, is so separate from how the rest of the world operates. Like the, the, just the normalities around it are so abnormal compared to the regular life. And what I mean by that is the way the competition is set up is if you don't win one premiership in 18 years, you're doing something wrong. Yep. So a team like, you know, uh, Sydney, when they broke their drought, um, when they beat West Coast, it was like 50 or 60 or some 72 years, seven, 72 years. <laughs> and they win that. And rightfully so they celebrate, they go bananas. It's the best day ever as it would be. I'm not having a go at them for doing it. Yeah. But isn't it funny how if it was any other walk of life, right? If, if your boss walks up to you and says, Doss, I need that spreadsheet done by um, next week, mate. You have seven days. And if you don't get it done for the next 60 days, your boss doesn't go, yeah, Ripper. <laughs> you've, you've got it done, mate, finally. It's like a about time. Now let's yep. now let's get it. So, you know, it's, uh, it's a funny little world sport. You win, the, you win the premiership and the next year you start all over again and yeah, we care so much about it and then it takes up so much of, of our life. After, after, after your friends and family, something has to matter. Exactly. Um, and it may as well be sport. I know. Well, it matters more than friends apparently. Yeah, <laughs> correct. Anyway, we've gone about it. We've, we've gone in circles here. We've uh, really covered absolutely everything. Just quickly, Rog, uh, I'll digress on that last topic before we get into the GBO. So last week uh, we had a potty where we were at our own houses and uh, we, I sent the potty off to Bailey from Ballarat who helps us out. We love Bailey from Ballarat. Um and he, he got back to me, he goes, geez, your, your, your potty's not sounding 
that great? <laughs> and I it went, was <laughs> alarming. I went, come on, Bailey, what are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> so I, I listened back and it sounded like I recorded my potty in a like cardboard box. Well, when I got to footy training, uh, <laughs> great ruckman of the twos and skipper of the Banyol Bears reserve side, Daniel Coulson said to me. Friend of the show. Friend of the show said, uh, Great podcast on the weekend, mate. Just quickly, did Caden record his podcast in the bath, did he? <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what yeah. did actually happen? Uh, well, I set everything up and started recording and ended up recording off my laptop microphone. Off Instead just of your actual microphone. Because I didn't change one of the channels. So I was just picking it up out of the atmosphere. Yeah, and it just sounded horrendous. So Bailey had to sort of use the mic uh, from the camera, but I didn't actually put an external mic on because I knew that I was recording with this. So it was an absolute disaster. Yeah, that is a mess. So I apologise to everyone in uh, the last podcast. We're recording on the right setting today, aren't we? I've been looking at it 55 times and... Oh, shit. No, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was uh, a big old pain last week listening back to that, but not as much <laughs> of a pain as what I imagine it would be to play against Reith. Matheson, what's his name? The Reece. Beast. Reece. But what's his nickname? Beast mode. Beast mode. Yeah, that's it. Reese. Reese. Beast mode. Matheson. That's a tough one. <laughs> it is a tough one. That is a bit of a tongue twister, especially when you have a list. <laughs> uh, yeah, the beast mode. Uh, he's uh, he's a uh, he went to school with Dutch. He, Did he? Yeah, he's a gro- another friend of the show, Dutchy. <laughs> he's he's a grovey boy. It feels like I would get the sense that Dutchy wouldn't get on very well with Reese <laughs> Matheson. That's my well, he plays for Dutchy's team, so he, he Dutchy does love the way he goes about it. Um, I, I think there's some admirable uh, characteristics about the way he plays. He's very tough. Mm. He loves the Lions. Is he real tough or is he fake tough? He's 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 real tough. As in, like, he cracks in, um, puts his head over it and, and, you know, loves winning the ball. And he loves the Lions. Uh, This is beast mode. Um, When he got drafted, he made a bit of a weird speech, but he was just like... But but it was passionate. He was like, listen, boys, like, I know we've been in hell the last couple of weeks because I was struggling a bit. But he goes, I just want to crack in. You know, let's go. And this is an 18-year-old kid getting his first game and he wasn't afraid to stand up and... Um, get it, you know, get around it and try and rev the boys up. So they love him. Like yeah. Mitch Robinson couldn't speak any highly of him. They absolutely love him. I but heard a uh, SEN interview on the weekend. <laughs> yeah. um, they were interviewing one of the players. I think it might have been Jared Lyons, actually, but I could be wrong on that. No, it was Lucky Neil. Lucky mm. Neil, because he was injured. So they interviewed him um, before the game was on. And they asked him, who's sort of, you know, the best characters at the club? The the blokes who, on a rainy day, they can make it seem like the sun is shining. Yep. And he singled out. Mitch Robinson and Reese Matheson. He said they're the two best blokes of the club to be around and you know perk you up. So yeah, maybe maybe you know looks can be deceiving. Don't judge a book by its cover. And off the field, behind closed doors, he could be the best bloke of all time. Hundred percent. But, but he doesn't look like field. it. <laughs> he does not look like but it. But on field, he acts like an absolute Wayne Kerr, so, and oh, it's it's. It's not good. <laughs> well, see, I've always said, I've said it on the podcast before, that I love characters. I don't care if you're a bad character, a good character, an annoying character, a wanky character. I love different characters in the game, something mm. for us to talk about. You know, it's something different than the vanilla cutouts we've seen. So I love the fact that he's himself. He's unashamedly, unapologetically himself. Yeah. I love that. But do I like the character? No, I hate that character. <laughs> <laughs> I I think he's very I think he's unnecessarily wankery. But I'm a I'm a wanker as well. And I a uh, self admitted wanker and I know that a lot of people think I'm a wanker. So <laughs> I I'm not uh not saying yeah, I'm not really talking shit about him. Yeah. But I'm just saying that he's a wanker. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so if, if you're listening to this, I'm actually not having a go yet because I do legitimately love characters in the game. But um, yeah, the way, you, the way you go about it does rub me the wrong way. It's sort of like WWE. Like you appreciate that he's a character in the arc of the narrative, but the character that he plays is a wanker. It's exactly. A sh- it's a shit character. So you appreciate that he's, he's on the field and you appreciate the way he goes about it, but... He's playing the bad yeah. guy, and he, and he is the bad guy. It's the perfect <laughs> analogy because when I'm watching wrestling, especially when I was a kid and the bad guy would come out, I'd hate him with every inch, with every centimetre of my fabric, 
uh, my genetic <coughs> makeup, I would hate him. Um, I changed to the metric system there just because I didn't want to <laughs> yeah. appeal too much to our American audience. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I uh, I hate them. But then I, I love the fact that they managed to make me hate them. It adds to the theatre. Yep. So I do hate the way he goes about it. Like when, uh, when I, I don't think anyone likes the way he goes about it. Well, you know, the way he was... You know, kicked the sausage roll, or even before he kicked the sausage roll, he took the mark, I think, yeah. and he was getting up in the player on the mark's grill, and then Liam he goes, Baker. Liam Baker's grill, you know, a two-time premiership player, Reese Matheson, struggling to get a game, <laughs> goes up, has a go at the two-time premiership player, uh, kicks the goal, gets up in his face again, then I'd, I'd love to be a little fly on his goonsy when Dustin Martin mm. rolled over, because it seemed to shut him up real quickly. And then Joe Danaher went over and went, uh... Not, not the time. We, yeah. don't, we don't want to be doing this, which which I like. But um, what do you reckon Dusty said to him? Because it was just, it wasn't like he came over and he yelled at him or anything. It was more, you know, when your parents. It's a bit the of classic, like, what are you? Who, who are you to talk? Yeah, and that that's how when your parents across. do the classic. I'm not angry. I'm just disappointed. It was like Dustin Martin walked over and he just looked at me and said, "Who are you?" or something like that. But the question is, how many needful flags does Dusty have? Ah, uh, well, that is a true question. How how many division, sure division two reserves <laughs> coaches awards does he have? Because <laughs> I think I might have his measure there old Dusty Martin but it reminds me of the Mason Cox conundrum mm. like an, another s- situation where um, you know he he doesn't understand but I like it I like when players go out who are 18 19 and they'll get in the grill of a Dusty because they're, they're they've been picked to be on the same park as him yep. so I'm going to compete with him and it's better than going out and going oh Dusty's there I I'm going to treat him differently to a different opponent. I like the 18-year-olds, like the Zachy Butters, who I know is not 18, but when they come in and they just treat... So I'm not sure about that. I, I, I think that if you're a um, if you're an 18-year-old kid coming in, I think there is a clear hierarchy of sort of respect. And, you know, I don't know if I was an 18-year-old kid playing my first game, if I'd go up to Dustin Martin, the greatest player of all time, the, the three-time Norm Smith medalist, and start, you know, getting up in his grill and talking as if I'm his equal when I'm well and truly am not. But I feel like, and, and I agree, I wouldn't do the same. And it does look odd when they do it. But I remember um, Butters, uh, Dersma, Rosie's first game, they all targeted Max Gorn and they went hard at him. And it was a whole team effort from Port. And I, at the time I was like, who are these Port Adelaide kids talking to half these Melbourne players? Like, who are these heroes? But they won the game and it was off the back of that. And I... I think if they went into that game with the attitude of like, oh, it's my first game on the big stage, I'll keep my head down and just go about it, I think they would have lost. But they had that that instinct that we belong here, we can give it to our opponents, we can tackle there, them. And it's not a black or white them. thing for me. I think you, everything you're saying, I, I, there are parts of me that agree with it. Yeah. I think there are elements of it where if I saw Brody Kemp, um, 20-year-old kid for Carlton, yet to play a game due to injury, if he came in and squared up Dustin Martin, <laughs> there would be elements of me that goes, you bloody ripper, this bloke knows yeah, what it's all yeah. about. Like, that would get me up and about yeah. until this bloke's up for the fight. But on the contrary, I do also think that you know you need to know your role and shut your mouth, as a rock would say. But also, Brody Kemp isn't doing uh, shotguns in front of Joel Salwood in his third game. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Reece Matheson that. kicks out on Joel Salwood and gives him the shotguns. Yeah, so, so, so that is... <laughs> that's the sort of stuff we're talking about, Reese. Oh. There's a bit of a difference between a Dursma and a Butter, just, you know, getting having a few words to Gorney and doing a shotgun to Joel Salwood. <laughs> That is, <laughs> don't that let is get a big it, difference. Don't let them get you down, Beast Mode. Uh, well, if you are feeling down out there, we've got something to pick you right back up because it's time for <laughs> the goals, behinds, and the out in the fools, the holy trinities of a football. I'll fire us in without out on the fools. Mm-hmm. Um, and we harped on this a bit earlier when I said that Eagles could be the team to drop out of the eight. Uh, and, yeah, my out on the fool is the Eagles just because they've had so many disappointing performances this year and historically as well away from home. Uh, and let's rank their disappointing performances. I reckon it goes. What the, I can't the, remember them off the top. Of the me game head, they it? lost to the Saints. Yep, shocking. Super disappointing. Shocking. Um, they got rolled by the Cats. Nearly a hundred points. Yeah. Well, that to me just goes to show that they're they're well and truly not up to it. Like those two losses alone, I know it's early in the season, mm. but to get smashed by the Saints and then absolutely obliterated by the jo- by Geelong, I know that it's Geelong, but you're not a premiership outfit when that sort of happens. You wouldn't say the dogs come out and lose by a hundred points no. to Geelong or have that real disappointment. But it's just weird that their worst looks like North Melbourne, but their best 
looks like the Bulldogs. So. Yeah, that's such a blight on on their psyche, on their genetic makeup. Is <laughs> like when when you're able to turn to water that easily, when you're that weak, something's like, going wrong. If it's that, I just couldn't. Skew if. <laughs> like I couldn't imagine. Like I know that once AFL could not be any more different to local football, mm. but I can imagine the team I play for rocking up and having bad weeks and having bad losses and having really good weeks where we look really impressive, but not to the point of losing by over 100 points to Geelong or there or thereabouts mm. and looking like a premiership contender. Like, that's just so bizarre. That That's not a talent thing. That is purely a mental thing. Mm. So they might out in the full for mental weakness. <laughs> well, that's, that's a good one. I probably should go as hard as you did uh, on West Coast as I do on my out in the full, which is the Saints. Do oh. we fold them as a club, or is that a bit too, dis- <laughs> or is that too disrespectful to say? <laughs> yeah, I was going to go the glass half full sort of pat them on the back, but you've just folded them. You've Tasmania shamed them. Yeah, well, I mean, look, what is look, going on? Look, All right, so is it is it they they got the best out of a COVID year, jumped up into the top eight, um, and sort of over exceeded expectations I, and over exceeded their their list, or is it is it a 2019 Melbourne where they're going down and coming back up? Have we got the trust in them to do I that? I don't see them having the A-grade talent or even the A-grade <laughs> potential talent to mix it. They have the talent to, yeah, they all play their best one year. They could finish a sixth. They could finish a fifth. They could win a final. Yeah. Yep. I don't see them having the talent on their list. Like, I don't look at them and go, yes, that's a list that one day will win a grand final or contend with the Bulldogs or a Melbourne with the way your list is now. And I've said this before. I think I said it at the start of the season. I don't really rate their list. And Brett Radden came out in the press conference and he's basically said, you know, obviously I'm putting a bit of mail on this, but he said that heads will roll. You know, he said that that was completely unacceptable next week. Um, there's going to be changes because uh, there are some twos players playing, playing well. Mm. Do you know who, who's been best in their twos? The, the players they're talking about bringing in? Who? Lukey Dunstan and Mason Wood. Now, are they yeah. like... Yep. Mason Wood, give me no, a spell. I think he played a couple of weeks ago and he played the way you'd expect Mason Wood to play. Like he he is he's not going to be the – like we've seen glimpses mm. for North Melbourne where it looks like he could put together a really solid season, but he hasn't for a long, long time and he's not going to be the saviour. So if that's the talent we have to look forward to – and like the way Ratman was talking about it, he was like, we've had some players showing really good form in the twos, so you know anyone not performing in the ones is going to go down. But yeah, it's not like these blokes are young up-and-coming prospects that could be elite and it's like, well, we have these young kids coming through mm. that they're going to come in now. You've got Mason Wood who's you know turned into a bit of a journeyman and Lukey Dunstan who just – you know he's not – Never it, quite. Never quite. Like he, good, yeah, but not great. Not inspiring me either, so – I don't think they're going to make the difference. So I do worry for St Kilda just because um, I don't see their, even if all their players do reach full potential, I don't see being good enough. And it doesn't help that their club, and you know, I think Carlton's in a pretty similar boat, um, the modern era of Carlton, where they just have a culture of losing. Their, yeah. their club, you know, they've been around, they're just about the oldest team in the comp and they've only won one flag. We we just talked about how, and I hate to be digging the heels in too much, so that, yeah, <laughs> it might hurt to hear, but well, might be a few hard truths here. But <laughs> fact is, like we said, that you should be winning one premiership every 18 years or 16 years when it was 16 teams or back when it was like 12 or 14 teams, <laughs> yeah. one in every 12 years. Yeah. And they've won one in 150. So... And, you know, they just – that's not a coincidence. That's not – that's a culture, a club that, like, you know, it's a weird thing. Like, a DNA, it's losing is in their DNA. And I don't see anything that suggests to me that they'll be coming out the other side of it soon. That takes <clears throat> a long, long time to uh, to get out of that sort of mindset. Like, that, that's a 10-year plan. You should be winning one in 18 <laughs> or back when it was 14 or 16, whatever it was. Yeah. And they've won one in 150, and it should be one in 18. Anyway, moving on, because I, I feel sorry. You just for railed two teams. Yeah, so. I'm starting <laughs> to feel sorry for the Saints now. Uh, my behind um, is an element of Carlton's game, um, because we did uh, we did win against the Hawks, but it was, it was a very ugly game. It was one of the worst games of football for the year, skills-wise, that I think you'll see. Yeah. Um, but my behind is that, did you hear David T came out and said that at halftime he gave them the biggest spray he's ever given them? No. 
So he came out and said, yeah, halftime, they cop the biggest spray that he's yet to del- that he's delivered yet uh, to all the boys, which, you know, and people have been saying for so long, we need to see more emotion from Tiggy. He's just a bit stone-faced and a bit too calm and calculated in the box. We wouldn't mind seeing a bit more emotion. Yep. So I don't hate that he's gone out and sprayed them, but I don't understand how Carlton can come in against Hawthorne and – require a spray at halftime. Like, different story if we were Melbourne, right? Melbourne, you are that good now. Or, or like a Geelong that, or Richmond who have seen success. They come in against a Hawthorne and they can probably rest on their laurels and expect to win because they've achieved something before. You yeah. are that good. Um, but why do these Carlton players who have really done nothing in the game yet, well, yet mm. these players haven't made finals, who are they to come in and in the first half not turn up. Like yep. you have no right to not turn up. You are in the same category as Hawthorne. I know that we're better than Hawthorne, but you're in the same category of you haven't done anything yet. So rock up every game, no matter if it's against Hawthorne, North Melbourne, mm. top of the ladder. You need to rock up with the mentality of 100% from the first part. I was a bit worried about the Blues on the weekend. Oh, bloody oath I was. I was shitting myself. Yeah. I was, yeah. Seeing the Hawks play that first half, I was going, oh, geez, could be one of those days. But, yep. um, they did well, the Blues, in the end, and then that sealer by Mackay, 55 out. That was some sort of goal, wasn't Roast it? That, it. Um, you know, he's been leading the Coleman, and um, there's a vibe of, you know, everyone understands that he's a real deal, but um, I don't think he got he's fully got the respect of the league in terms of his premier key forward in the competition. No, he doesn't. Um, but after kicking that goal, I think that was a big statement that he's not just big, big lanky Harry that can take a clunk from 15 out and snap it through because he can't kick drop punts. He actually, that was a mark and goal of a player who's ready to take the competition by the scruff of the neck. He's got a clear lead in the Coleman, but that was a goal of someone who could stamp his authority as a top five player in the game. Yeah, I agree. That was unreal. Nice exclamation mark uh, for the end of the game for the Blues. Uh, My behind, (coughs) weird one. So the behinds, you know, as we know, uh, the thing we're a little bit iffy on. Um, my behind is Harris Andrews on the mark. Did you see this? Did not see this, no. Friday night, um, it was towards the end of the game. He was on the mark. I can't remember who was having the shot. Maybe Tom Lynch was having the shot, but he just started going a bit meme mode. Like what? He just started making weird faces and flopping his oh. hands around and sort oh, of... Oh, sw- wacky, waving inflatable arm, man. That's what he was doing. That's what he was doing, just swaying on the on the mark. And I actually did hear this because I um, was listening to it on Triple M. I remember it now because I remember them saying, oh, he's doing the wacky, waving inflatable arm, man. Yeah, he was. Um, so what, you're not a fan of those sort of antics on the mark? I just thought it was a bit bizarre. I'm not necessarily sold on it, if I'm going to be Did he honest. kick the goal or not? I can't recall. If he kicks the goal then I certainly think it's a behind because you look like a moron. Uh, but if he kicks uh, if he kicks it out in the full or he kicks it behind, then I think you've had every right to do what you've done. Mo- Doss has just got the footage up for me here. This is the first time we've had footage live in the po- uh, live in the back pocket. Play so it's Lynch going back. They're up by 30. He booed him. He booed him and then just starts just doing some bizarre. Yeah, see, uh, see I don't like... I, you know what I don't like about that? This reminds me, and this will be shock you for, for you to hear what this And then Lynch went back of. and slotted it. It reminds me of um, when the Australian national cricket team tampered with the ball. <laughs> now, I don't mind you tampering with the ball. Okay? Right now, I'm a, I, at, at, at my heart... I'm a, I'm a bit of a cheater. I don't mind bending the rules and finding ways to win. If you ever play me in cards, watch out because I like to extort every possibility to make sure I win. Yep. But if you're going to cheat, do it in a way that actually has a bit of wit to it, a bit of smarts, a bit of where, like, you know, when you break into a casino and you go, wow, how did they do that? Uh, don't just put a bit of sandpaper in your jocks and rub it on the ball. <laughs> like, give me, give me, you know, Put some eat. Start eating some citrusy fruit that makes you sweat, particularly as acidic. And then when you sweat on the ball, do something a bit clever. Mm. Uh, what was I talking about? Oh, Harris Andrews. <laughs> yeah, Harris Andrews. How it relates to the Australian yeah. team. When he is on the mark, I don't mind you putting him off, but do something a bit creative. Do something a bit smart. Something that makes me go, oh, yep, that's funny. That's witty. Yep. Don't start doing the wacky waving inflatable arm, man, and look, make <laughs> yourself look like an idiot. No, he did. He, uh, it looked. It was a little bit silly. Oh, I'm. That might be a bit of a far stretch, the analogy is there, but I'm glad I went with it anyway. No, nah, no, nah, I liked it. But, uh, yeah, I, I'm not saying absolutely don't do it. I'm just a little bit not sure on it. Yeah. My, I'll watch this space. While talking about Harris Andrews, my sausage roll for the week is just the Brisbane Lions because they started the season so shaky. Um, 
uh, not so shaky, but just not overly convincing. Um, they probably weren't in my premiership calculations and for a lot of people either. Um, but they have romped home. Is it four or five wins on the trot now? And uh, they look almost unstoppable. And, you know, all these players like your Jared Lyons and they've got Stasovic in the back mm. pocket who... I'll Zach be, Bailey. I'll be... Oh. You know, Zach Bailey's... Oh, man. Four. But I'll be honest with Stasovic. I... I was under the illusion he was just a fringe player. Like, yes, yeah. I didn't because you know you don't. I don't watch a whole lot of Brisbane games. Obviously, I just watch every game that I can when I'm at home. Yeah. But I don't pay special attention to him. So when I'm watching them, you know, the name Starsevich gets read out by a commentator, and I, I just think that's another player getting the pill, hitting the 15 meter diagonal. I don't think anything yeah, of it. Yeah. Yeah. But then they showed me the they showed the stats of the small forwards he stopped, and he is right in all Australian calculations according to the experts. He played really well under. Dusty. Kept him to no goals. Unbelievable. Um, and yeah, the Lions rob home against the Tigers. And now all of a sudden, you're struggling to see holes in their list. No, 100%. I agree. And it, the year when they jumped up, it was sort of like, this is an amazing effort. I think they went out in straight sets. But it was amazing because they went from 15th to 2nd in 12 months. So that, that was amazing. No expectations. Then last year, there was expectations. And they were just a top four you know, top side premiership sort of uh, crack at it, but they didn't quite get there. They fell short. Oh, I feel like this is the year where they're sort of, this is it. They could win the flag. They oh, absolutely yeah. could win oh, the flag. I feel like this is has been building and has been building quite naturally and quite nicely. And Fags I, is just the man. He, he is the man. Joe Danaher like up Fags. front. It's just looking all, all the right. piece of the puzzle. They've got the small forwards. They've yeah. McCluggage. <laughs> he well, could. A get, grade. Well, you know, I think um, McCluggage and uh, I hate to keep relating things back to Carlton, but it looks like McCluggage and Walsh, you know, we've had that breed of like, it was like Ablett and Fife and mm. Dangerfield and Pendlebury and these players were the A-plus graders we're talking about. Yep. Um, I think we now quite clearly see the next breed of legitimate A-plus plus players and I think McCluggage is going to be one of them. Yeah. Yep. Would you agree with that? Do yes, you think he's, he's going to be that... I think upper Tim, echelon. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, he's a star. Um, and the Lions, yeah. Jeez. I'd be very nervous versing them in the next few, well, for the rest of the year, but they've got a nice run home against, uh, well, at, at the Gabba. Absolutely. Jeez, it was tough for me to get that out. You're I right. was trying to think of a segue. Uh, my goal uh, is Clayton Oliver's performance. I thought he was going <laughs> to will us over the line. I sort of get frustrated when... With some lazy analysis. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Some people often go... We, cer- we certainly don't do that here. Your cam's gone off. Oh, my camera's gone off. Mm-hmm. It's only going to be Caden and uh, Caden and the duo <laughs> from here on here. No solo Rog. That's okay. We don't need me. Um, yeah, so uh, Clayton Oliver performance. I-, I can get a little bit frustrated at times when people will go, why, do- why are they taking Clayton Oliver as if you wouldn't take Petrarca? And Clayton Oliver gets... Gets the tag every week. Every time we play, Clayton Oliver gets the tag. So, yeah. 18, 17 coaches, 17 AFL coaches, there's a, a clear reason why they're tagging Clayton Oliver over Christian Petrarca. But the general pundits go, he's overrated, just handballs. Why, why are you tagging him? He is phenomenal. And he's been the most consistent player I've ever seen play in the red and blue from debut to where he is now. He's got one of the best 100 games um, starts to a, a career that you could think of. Um, he is so good, so consistently, kicked two goals, one, should have got three actually, but he mungs all these set shots this year. But um, yeah, 38 touches, 27 or 28 contested. It is just crazy. And he gets his hands on the footy so well in the one-on-ones in the middle, those decisive one-on-ones. And that's the difference between clearance and a non-clearance for us. Like if he gets his hands on it, more chances or not, we're getting the ball forward. But when he can't, we don't. So he's just so important. And um, when he kicked that goal to put us up by three goals towards the end of the game against the Crows, I thought he's single-handedly won us this game. One of the most amazing performances I've seen from a bloke in the red and the blue. Um, too bad five minutes later we lost. Yeah. <laughs> but it was an incredible game. Uh, I remember when the Bontempelli and Cripps argument, we talked about this last week, but when that argument was popping up, I would get offended that people would offend, uh, compare Bont <laughs> to Cripps. I thought Cripps was streets ahead. Well, he was. And then uh, and then Clayton Oliver started coming into it, and I took even more offence to that. <laughs> I thought, I think we even occasionally uh, butted heads about it a bit, like as in I would say, you know, me mate 
Ben Cockrell, who's a staunch days man, uh, dared comparing Oliver to Cripps, and I said, don't you dare be silly, and then we got a side-by-side of the stats up, and it turns out his stats did sort of compare, mm. but I just thought he was nowhere near as damaging yeah. as Cripps. But fast forward to here we are now, and Oliver's well and truly got Cripps measure. Well, in that 100-game bracket, it was like, I, I think Cripps had the record for the most handballs in... Or the the uh, most contested possessions and clearances. I yeah, in was. twenty games and and most ha- uh, f- first to get uh, lowest amount of games to get to a thousand handballs and it was like Patrick Cripps, and then it, he just kept pipping every one of those records, Clayton Oliver. So that's when the talk started coming, like, oh, Clayton Oliver's actually in this echelon because he's got the record for um, those sort of stats. But um, yeah, amazing performance and. Too bad we lost, so it doesn't really matter. Uh, well, but it's still a great <laughs> goal, and if he keeps that form up and Petrarca keeps that form up, you'll be there or thereabouts come the final weekend in September, and that's all that matters. I reckon that's it for the episode. Uh, well, shame it was such a shit one, mate. Uh, <laughs> we might have to hang the boots up after this week because we're no good at this. Yeah, no, we um, really, really struggled. I, I think it's just our lack of experience on the mic that, <laughs> that probably let us down. Actually, you know what? I enjoyed that. And I thought that was a fantastic <laughs> episode, McDonald. Uh, I appreciate you coming down, Rog. Um, good to smash out another one. Got a busy week? Yeah, always a busy week. Like I said, new trivia venue tomorrow night. So you won't hear this episode public. But um, when you do, make sure you get down to the Yorkshire and Stingo the next, the following Monday. And we have a goal recreation coming out of my channel. Uh, coming out of my channel on Thursday. San bloody sensational. Massive. It's going to be massive. Um, really can't wait for you guys to see that. Until next week, another week of footy. We'll talk to you then. We appreciate everyone who listened and everyone who watched. And we'll see you next time for the Back Pocket Plugger Podcast. Keep plugging those back pockets.